diabetes ketoacidosis or non-ketotic hyperglycemia are uh, life, two of life-threatening and acute metabolic complications of diabetes. Um, our annual average here in the States is about 100,000 per, um, per year um, that patients get hospitalized uh, for diabetes ketoacidosis. And both conditions are part of the continuum of hyperglycemia with or without ketosis or ketone accumulation. Um, so what are those two conditions? Um, they both can occur in type 1 and type 2 diabetes. 2 to 8 percent of all diabetes hospital admissions here in the U.S. are for the treatment of PKA. Um, it in increases in the past 30, uh, in the past decade by about 30 percent, and we are not sure what's exactly uh, causing that increase, significant increase. Um, annual incidence is about five to eight episodes per thousand patients and appear to be again on the rise. Um, there are still uh, mortality rates are low, but they're still significant and more so with non-ketotic hyperglycemia than with ketoacidosis, as you can see by the numbers that DKA is less than 5%, but non-ketotic hyperglycemia is still could be approaching to 15%. Uh, prognosis is worse in the extreme of ages and presence of either coma or very low. So I think we're, we're still on that same slide, and I'm sorry for all the technical difficulties. Um, so the uh, diabetes ketoacidosis is, is, as initial presentation can occur in about 15 to 20 percent of adults as initial presentation of diabetes, and about um, in 30 to 40 percent in patients specifically with type 1 diabetes. So what could precipitate uh, the occurrence of DKA or um, non-ketotic hyperglycemia? Infection is the most common one, and it could be any kind of infection. Most common ones are pneumonia or urinary tract infection, alcohol or drug abuse, uh, silent myocardial infarction, we see that often, especially in patients with a diabetes, pre-existing diabetes, um, they are not able to uh, necessarily feel the pain from the chest, uh, or chest pain from the heart attack, but the high blood sugar could be the first manifestation of the heart attack and not being able to bring those down. Um, stroke, pancreatitis, trauma, different medications, Steroids being the most common one. Um, higher dose of thiazide diuretics, although we rarely use the high dose nowadays, and different antipsychotic medications. Hot weather um, over summertime, and I guess in your case, would be even more common. And insufficient water intake in elderly patients or um, insulin just getting bad from the hot weather. Uh, non-compliance with insulin therapy, and that's primarily affecting patients with type 1 diabetes. Um, so what is the pathogenesis of diabetes ketoacidosis? Um, there are three main conditions that are uh, kind of lumped together. Those would be hyperglycemia, acidosis, and ketosis. So when they all get together, this is um, the current about uh, uh, DKA diabetes ketoacidosis happens. So there's some sort of precipitating event. At the same time, there's a decrease in the insulin production, but increase in the counter-regulatory hormones, including cortisol and glucagon from the pancreas, um, breaking down the fat tissue, um, and also breaking down the protein. That all creates this extra substrate going to the liver, and liver making the new glucose, gluconeogenesis, contributing to hyperglycemia. Plus, there is, due to the insulin deficiency, there is a decreased glucose uptake in the tissues. High blood sugar flowing through the kidneys, causing dehydration and osmotic diuresis. And again, because of the fat tissue breakdown, lipolysis, release of the free fatty acids, ketone formation, increased ketone in the blood and the urine, that all contributes to acidosis. So ketoacidosis is a pro-inflammatory state. Severe hyperglycemia triggers macrophages to produce cytokines, such as uh, tumor necrosis factor alpha, 
um, interleukin-6, interleukin-1-beta, and um, CRP. Uh, there is an increase, um, decrease in insulin secretion at the same time increase in the insulin resistance. And this free fatty acid release from the uh, fat tissue breakdown because of the inability to utilize the glucose further contributes to insulin resistance, impaired nitric oxide production, and dysfunction of the endothelium and the blood vessels. So what are the differences and similarities between non-ketotic hyperglycemia and diabetes ketoacidosis? Diabetes ketoacidosis uh, is associated with severe insulin deficiency, and that's what contributes to the ketone formation. On the other hand, in non-ketotic hyperglycemia, there is usually moderate insulin deficiency. So there is some insulin being produced, and there is only 10% of the concentration of insulin needed to very small amount to suppress the ketone formation, comparing to how much insulin needed to be able to grab the glucose from the blood and bring it into the cell. There is a higher concentration of free fatty acids in DKA and, again, lower concentration of insulin um, comparing to non-ketotic hyperglycemia where there is a lower concentration of free fatty acids and higher concentration of the insulin. Uh, the, in terms of the clinical presentations and some, again, differences and similarities between those two conditions, uh, first, polyuria, polydipsia are common for both, weakness common for both, weight loss common for both, but more present so in DKA than non-ketotic hyperglycemia, nausea and vomiting because of the ketone accumulation would be in DKA, but less so or rare in um, non-ketotic hyperglycemia. Abdominal pain is again more common in diabetes ketoacidosis. Uh, for the physical signs and symptoms, hypothermia could be in both. Hypotension could be in both. Um, tachycardia uh, would be in both because of the volume uh, depletion. Um, uh, too small breathing, um, ileus, uh, could more so in the DKA. Um, acetone breath, more, uh, only in DKA and very minimal, if any, in non-ketotic hyperglycemia and altered um, sensorium or altered consciousness could be in both, depending on the degree of the severity of the condition. For the presentation, uh, DKA usually presents with more acute onset that um, develops over hours or a few days, versus the non-ketotic hyperglycemia usually days to weeks. Um, Non-ketotic more in the older, older age and more common in type 2 diabetes and rather than DKA, more common than type 1 diabetes. Neurological symptoms could be um, in both, but again, it's more common in non-ketotic hyperglycemia because the plasma acetylality reaches to over 320, 330 milliosmoles per kilogram more commonly in um, non-ketotic hyperglycemia than in DKA. Uh, interestingly, the DKA frequently presents with abdominal pain like a stomach flu, and that the higher the degree of the ketosis, the more common the symptom uh, that we see. Uh, on physical examination, uh, we see all the signs of volume depletion, decreased skin trigger, decreased oral, uh, dry oral mucosa, low jugular venous pressure and low blood pressure hypertension. More in DKA, we see those fruity otter due to uh, its exhaled acetone, ketone deep respiration, small breathing, and 25% of patients can present with coffee grounds, uh, emesis, um, kind of um, uh, sh showing or simulating uh, the um, gastrointestinal bleeding. This is usually due to just stress gastritis, hemorrhagic gastritis. Those patients do not need to have endoscopy. It's usually resolved with the resolution of DKA. Mental status, as we said, it from varies from full alertness to lethargy or coma. Uh, temperature could be normothermic normal or hypothermic due to peripheral vasodilation, and hypothermia is a poor prognostic sign. So for the laboratory evaluation, uh, we uh, order plasma glucose, BN creatinine, serum ketones, 
uh, electrolytes. Uh, we've calculated anion gap um, and uh, is serum osmolality. So our lab provides us already with a calculating um, anion gap. I don't know if you already get that. Uh, but if you don't, the formula is chloride plus um, bicarb and then sodium um, minus this um, uh, some uh, uh, the sum of the uh, chloride and bicarb. For your analysis, we check for a possible infection and also check for urine ketones. ABG is useful, and because it's a painful test, venous lab gas is uh, uh, acceptable. Um, CBC was differential, although knowing that WBC, the white tooth count, may be increased just because of the dehydration. Electrocardiogram is important because, as we said before, that silent myocardial infarction can be present, especially in patients with longer standing diabetes. Bacterial cultures of blood and urine show what infectious causes a precipitating event. Hemoglobin A1C is very useful if it has not been done within the past three months, and chest X-ray is indicated that there are symptoms of possible respiratory uh, infection. Uh, what are the laboratory criteria for the diagnosis of ketoacidosis versus non-ketotic hyperglycemia? Uh, glucose usually lower levels than DKA, over 250, and non-ketotic hyperglycemia usually present with fairly high blood sugars over um, 600. Uh, for our arteri for the pH, um, there will be more of the acidotic in DKA and could be normal in non-ketotic hypoglycemia. Bicarb would be low, less than 15 and, um, in DKA and could be normal or very mildly low in non-ketotic hypoglycemia. BUN would be much higher in non-ketotic hyperglycemia. There's a higher degree of the dehydration. Osmolality uh, would be higher in non-ketotic hyperglycemia because the blood sugar would be much higher. Again, ketones in the blood and serum would be more uh, um, frequently present and a higher degree in DKA than in non-ketotic hyperglycemia, although small ketones can be present. And anion gap would be elevated significantly in DKA um, and usually normal in non ketotic hyperglycemia. So we have this definition as mild to moderate DKA. When bicarbonate is 10 to 18 and pH is still over um, 7.3. Uh, for again, for laboratory measurements, usually sodium level is low due to elevated plasma osmolality and we can correct for serum sodium um, using 1.6 times 100 milligram per deciliter of glucose above 100 um, to the measured sodium. So it's uh, all, so the degree of hyponatremia or low sodium may not be as bad when you calculate when you correct for hyperglycemia. Uh, for plasma potassium, Usually body uh, is profoundly deficient in potassium because of the loss of potassium in the urine. Um, but um, in the blood, it could be moderately uh, low, um, less than the whole body deficiency because of the lack of the insulin or um, not being able to, for the insulin to uh, bring the potassium into the cells. Um, the plasma phosphate is usually low, and again, it's because of the uh, loss of the phosphorus in the urine, and also acidosis leads to negative phosphate balance. So the main goal of the therapy is correction of dehydration, correction of hyperglycemia, electrolyte imbalance, and identifying precipitating factors and frequent monitoring. Um, so for care for diabetes, so again, one most important uh, factor is give lots of fluids and correct for electrolytes. Uh, measure your uh, measure intake and output to make sure you're matching those. Monitor serum worker or electrolytes closely. Monitor for vital signs uh, for dehydration, for tachycardia, and uh, orthostatic hypertension. Um, for the fluid therapy, again, this is one of the most important, um, the first therapy that we introduced in uh, DKA and non-ketotic hyperglycemia. The fluid deficit is 
about three to six liters in DKA and eight to 10 liters in non-ketotic hyperglycemia. So we start with um, normal saline usually, and you can give 15 to 20 milligrams per kilogram per hour in the first hour, or just give us a bolus of uh, one to one and a half liter. And then we assess if sodium is normal or high normal or high or elevated or normal, then you can switch to half normal saline. If sodium is still low, then continue the normal saline. And you can use five to 15 milligram per kilogram per hour uh, of the rate of the um, of fluid infusion. Now, what is the most also extremely important, when glucose is down to less than 250, change to glucose solution. So you need to add the dextrose, the D5, in order to keep insulin infusion because you need to clear the ketones or you need to uh, close the gap. So the only way to close the gap and to, um, to resolve the acidosis is to continue with the insulin. Um, so therefore, the target for our blood sugar for DKA is not to get down to normal but actually to keep as to 150 to 200 and up to 250 for non-ketotic hyperglycemia. Um, as for insulin therapy, you can give it insulin as a bolus or you can just give the um, infusion, um, approximately 0.1 units per kilo per hour and then titrate it. Um, so the serum glucose should fall by about 50 to 70 milligrams per deciliter in the first hour. And if it doesn't, then double the rate of infusion. And again, the important part is if blood glucose drops to less than 250, add the dextrose to IV fluids in order to allow for um, the insulin drip to be going and to continue uh, with the um, closing the gap and clearing the ketones. Uh, electrolyte replacement. That's Again, it's a very important part of the treatment of ketoacidosis. Um, if um, potassium is less than 3.3, all the insulin infusions should be on hold. Or if you have not initiated insulin yet and potassium is already 3.3, do not in initiate infusion until potassium is replaced. Again, this is critically important because those patients can uh, go into severe arrhythmia from low potassium, because as soon as you give the insulin, more potassium would be entering the cells, which can cause profound hypokalemia and precipitate um, deadly arrhythmias. Um, so again, um, I think in our hospital and everywhere, um, also uh, the physicians and nurses are concerned about not giving insulin, but uh, this is safer to hold it or to postpone the insulin until potassium replaced because of that reason. So give 40 milligrams of potassium per hour um, and to replace it first um, to at least uh, potassium over 3.3 before you in, in, reinstall or reinitiate the um, insulin. So you're still treating the patient, you're giving the fluids, you're giving the potassium replacement. When potassium is between 3.3 but less than five, um, already start with giving 20 to 30 milliequivalents in each liter of normal fluid of potassium because, again, insulin is driving potassium in the cells and reducing potassium in the blood. If potassium level is over five to begin with, which is common uh, because, again, all the potassium from the cells is now in the blood, before you start giving insulin, you don't have to give potassium right away, but watch closely uh, every two hours because it's going to drop. Um, in terms of the bicarbonate, if pH is let over seven, do not give bicarb. Insulin blocks the lipolysis and resolves ketoacidosis itself, so without the need of bicarbonate. Uh, phosphate, there is no value of giving replacements of phosphate unless it's really low, less than one, then you can give 20 to 30 milligrams of k uh, of adding to the, fluid, to the maintenance fluid. So monitoring um, is important. Uh, check the blood sugars every hour and check electrolytes. Again, as we said, venous gas is okay to check every two to four hours. Uh, venous pH is only 0 
units lower than arterial pH. So keep that in mind, and it's okay to follow the venous pH because, again, ABG or uh, arterial blood gas is very painful. Um, follow gap to monitor for resolution of ketacid doses. Uh, ketones may take over 36 hours uh, to clear. So don't measure ketones anymore, just uh, measure, remeasure the gap. So the criteria for resolution of GTA for glucose less than 200, bicarb over 18, venous pH over 7.3, and in part one is normalization of the gap. So if gap is still on the borderline high or elevated, do not discontinue the drip. So when all the criteria are mapped, or resolution of the DCA, and then you can discontinue the drip. So uh, one and most important part of that before discontinuing the drip is to give a substitute insulin before turning off the drip and overlapping uh, the time of the substitute insulin with the drip. And timing of how much to overlap depends on the which insulin we're using. Um, so I'm, I'm happy to send the slides and to share them. Um, this is kind of the uh, recommendation summary from American Diabetes Association, um, and it pretty much goes over what we've just discussed about um, the management of the, um, the diabetes ketoacidosis. Now, the chart includes, I'm just going to point you out to, to this uh, part of the uh, table or graph. Uh, it's possible to use sub insulin if you don't have a access IV or patient is really hard to get. Um, there are studies showing that it could be effective, um, the same as uh, it effective as intravenous if you follow those patients really closely. So you can start with 0.2 units per kilo as a sub-Q bolus, and then give 0.2 units per kilo sub-Q every two hours, and you check glucose every one to two hours. And um, Serum glucose, again, it's the same kind of principle as uh, the follow the same um, as uh, your other um, um, uh, 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 management that we've discussed. So transition to sub insulin when patient is alert, able to eat, and again, overlap with at least two hours. Um, this is, again, this is from ADA, from American Diabetes Association. So don't rush it. As as, as it as did take it, uh, the resolution of BKA and non-ketotic hyperglycemia takes time. Um, so the patient has been on the drip only for two to four hours. Uh, just keep it longer. You need to have the blood sugar stabilized and to have the drip um, plus minus the unit stable for at least three to four hours, plus all the other criteria that we discussed about before you can switch the patient from, uh, from the drip or um, intense management to the uh, regular sub injection. So it has been shown that the average time required for resolution of DK is up to 18 hours and non-ketotic hyperglycemia 9 to 11 hours. But we've seen the, so the higher the blood sugar presentation, the longer it takes and the higher the ketones, the longer it takes to, um, for DK to resolve. How do we switch from uh, IV to sub-Q? Always try to make changes in the morning. Don't do it at midnight when everyone is tired and um, alertness of the staff is not as good. Um, use insulin infusion for the past 24 hours, uh, but um, usually we say use the rate for the past two, three to four hours and then extrapolate to 24 hours. Uh, so, for example, if the rate over the last 34 hours was one unit per hour, um, then use as 24 units, times 24 uh, as a 24 units as a total daily um, dose. So, if meal is planned, you can give Lispra or um, Aspart or um, Humalog or Novolog insulin or whichever short-acting insulin you have and administer it uh, 10 to 15 minutes before the meal. You can turn off the drip after subcutaneous acting, short acting insulin is given, um, but also give the um, NPH um, insulin one to two hours before the drip is stopped. And if you're using the longer acting insulin, such as glargine uh, or others, it should be at least two hours before the drip uh, is stopped. 
Um, if patient is not previously on insulin, it's not the not new onset diabetes or something was precipitating it, schedule sub Q insulin infusion. Uh, um, if patients requiring more than two units per hour, if not, it can just start with short acting and then see what are the requirements uh, for the insulin. Um, so we just talked about how to calculate the dose. So when we calculate the total daily dose used as 50% as a basal insulin, which would be long or intermediate acting, and 50% divide between three meals. And they use corrected dose as needed. Um, so the recommendations from ADA were um, introduced in 2012, and we are still we're using the same uh, recommendations that adding a scheduled insulin dose to patients without prior history of diabetes and blood sugar over 140 with persistent requirement of corrective dose within 12 to 24 hours after the drip is stopped. So meaning if you have not scheduled the prenatal dose because you are concerned that patients' insulin requirements are low, if you are seeing that within the next 12 to 24 hours there is a persistent requirement of the corrective scale, you can add that uh, corrective scale as a just a scheduled pre-meal dose. Um, so um, our um, and American Diabetes Association every year comes with um, their recommendations and updates. Um, so the updates were um, this year and the same from last year is to check hemoglobin A1C for all patients with diabetes or hyperglycemia admitted to the hospital if not done within before, uh, three months prior to admission. Uh, basal or um, basal insulin or basal plus the bolus correction insulin is preferred for non critically ill patients with poor oral intake and for taking nothing by mouth. An insulin regimen with basal nutritional and correction component is preferred um, rather than using sliding scale alone. For um, sliding scale alone treatment, very strongly discouraged. And important thing is um, plan for discharge recommendations at the time of the admission already. Um, so that you have time to decide which medications to a patient is going to go home on, provide enough education for those patients um, before they get discharged, not at the last minute. Um, we have now, I don't know if you are using um, the medications, the new class of drugs, which is the sodium glucose transporter inhibitor. Um, so we're using them for type 2 diabetes and rarely using them for type 1 diabetes. So what we can see in patients who are using those medications, those patients can present with this new kind of entity that we call normal glycemic or euglycemic decay. So blood sugar would be normal, usually less than 200. It can be in both type 1 and type 2. There are 73 cases reported by last year. I think there are way more now. It could be more presented and also besides the, um, the patients who are on this medication, it can be present in pregnancy, in the state of prolonged starvation, um, in the alcohol abuse, or patients partially treated with the insulin. So the medication for this, the one that I mentioned, SGLT2 inhibitor, it blocks the glucose uh, reabsorption in the proximal tubule and let glucose um, flow into the urine and uh, pretty much patients will pee out the glucose. Um, so um, the pathophysiology of this is that glucose level goes down and this is insulin independent. It's just the release from the urine. But because glucose level is goes down, insulin level goes down, glucagon level goes up, and all the same things that we discussed uh, before, ketone uh, formation, fatty acid production go to ketone formation, and the DKA can happen in the setting of normal blood sugar. How do we manage those patients? We suspected uh, even when blood sugar is normal um, in the setting of acute illness or a patient is being on those medications, hold the medicine and advise patient to hold the medication periodically during the prolonged fast or if patients are on very low carb diet, start low dose of insulin and you can start IV fluids with dextrose with, blood, with sugar at the same time um, and monitor closely. 
So patients can uh, develop uh, non um, anion gap acidosis in the recovery, and it can happen within 24 to 48 hours. So monitor bicarbonate and electrolyte uh, till bicarb normalizes. Um, so that's um, the USMDK kind of concludes my talk.